All right, so I wanted to bring to your attention and uh, do a little review of a uh, website called Born Unix uh, homepage and library. Now let's start off with the uh, first two short little paragraphs that sound really good. Almost all people are bisexual by nature, although most people choose or are conditioned to limit themselves to the opposite sex. Thus, for almost all so-called straight people, their sexual identity is defined by their behavior and is subject to influence or change. In fact, in the ancient world, most people were actively bisexual in their behavior at different times in their lives. However, as a minority, gays differ by nature from this majority, not in our attraction to the same sex, but only in our physical lack of response to the opposite sex. Being naturally impotent for procreative sex, innately gay men were referred to in the ancient world as born eunuchs, or just eunuchs. Meanwhile, women who are innately, well, who cares about that? Uh, but the point is that uh, this website acknowledges that, uh, you know, most men are bisexuals by nature, but they still want to differentiate gays into another category. So he has a couple articles, and he has a main thesis. The uh, articles, the first one talks about third genders in ancient Egypt. Uh, that's interesting to look at. Uh, then there's an article called Natural Eunuchs in Roman, uh, in Roman Law. And what he tries to do there is generally when people think of eunuchs, they think of castrated men in the ancient world. And the point that he makes is that in fact, there are different kinds of eunuchs. So there were castrated men, but there were also people who were born eunuchs. And it wasn't that their genitalia was cut off, but that they were fundamentally different, uh, but they had genitalia, but not attracted to women. So what he concludes is, more evidence could be brought forth to, to negate the false assumption that eunuch status implied castration, and to demonstrate that a lack of sexual drive with women, as well as certain effeminacy of body and disposition, and even a lust for homosexual sex were stereotypical characteristics of eunuchs. So he tries to say that eunuchs are basically like the gays. That's, that's the connection. That the natural born eunuchs were not castrated, they did not have genital malformations, but they were just gay men in the old times. Uh, another article, uh, Histor Historic Origin of Church Condemnation of Homosexuality, he talks about, uh, I think, uh, well, Oh, Theodosius II, or Theodosius, I prefer, Theodosius in 390 passed a law that's, that forbade same-sex sex. He talks about that. I've talked about that. It's an interesting other perspective. Uh, um, it goes into a little more detail. Um, that 390 was when the, when, uh, the Christian uh, takeover of the Roman Empire, I think, was complete. They started banning pagan temples. They banned the Olympics. Uh, they banned same-sex sex. sex. Uh, paganism was pretty much on the decline at that point and was outlawed. So that's interesting to look into. Uh, Plato, Serpent in the Garden of Sexuality. He makes the case that uh, things started to go downhill with Plato uh, many, many centuries before the Christians took over, maybe even a, a millennium before. Let me just read what he says. Uh, it's a short paragraph. So, if Plato's work is a treasure trove of positive ancient characterizations of homosexuality, that is only because those positive characterizations were current in his world. They are the starting point from which Plato wishes to lead his followers and, and society into exclusive heterosexuality and marriage. In The Republic, The Laws, and his other works, Plato sought to devise a system of education that would promote what he considered to be qualities of an ideal man. Wisdom, justice, temperance, and courage. Sexuality was fundamentally dangerous and antithetical to his project, so he said, because it was characterized by mental frenzy as opposed to rationality. Uh, he has all the citations in there, so if you want to look it up, you can. And again, all, all of this is going to be included in the thread uh, linked below. And because sexual acts fail to teach courage to one partner, the passive, and temperance to the other, the active, the only justification for sexuality to exist at all was for procreation. Therefore, all sexuality outside of marriage should be forbidden by law. If only that were possible, he laments. Getting everyone to agree to this moral code would be difficult, uh, but once it was established, it would perpetuate itself if, if only all people could somehow be prevented from ever contradicting or denying it. He offers various potential means for establishing the acceptance of such a moral code, 
including telling children at an impressionable age that non-marital sex is hated by God, that abstinence from sex represents a victory even more glorious than any athletic or military victory, and that failure to be abstinent is ugly and makes you lower than the animals. He also suggests requiring that people hide their sexual practice so that the sight of some people enjoying sex would not become an enticement to others. Finally, one could simply enact a law forbidding all uh, forbidding all homosexual sex and all sex outside of marriage or concubinage. Uh, this is Western sexuality, sexual morality in a nutshell. So anyways, that is sort of interesting because Plato does, does if you read the laws, uh, which are also included in this book, uh, Homosexuality in Greece and Rome by Thomas K. Hubbard. It's a translation. I, all of this is included in there uh, that's quoted here. And it is very interesting because Plato does seem to come down on same-sex sex. But if you read it, you get the, you get the impression that perhaps uh, it's more, you know, it's more of a uh, devil's advocate position. Uh, that Plato might be just saying, like, well, this is this is how you could say it. He, he's just arguing for the sake of arguing. Uh, I don't, and, and and that could be the case because Plato himself had boyfriends, and I believe his boyfriend uh, uh, inherited his academy. Anyways, his main thesis is uh, eunuchs are gay men. Very blunt to the point. And what he says is the common denominator in gay men and castrated men, which could be the basis for categorizing both groups under the term eunuch is that neither one is suitable for marriage. This indeed was the point of the gospel verse that he mentions here uh, when Jesus talks about eunuchs. But in order to prove beyond a doubt that born eunuchs were gay men, I had to prove that like gay men, born eunuchs could have complete genitals, they had no lust for women, and they had lust for men. And I'm not going to go into the, all the evidence here. You can look it up. It's, it's just to entice you to look into the evidence. But the, the question is why bring this up? Uh, why bring this uh, whole thing up here? Uh, well, there's a couple things. I mean, first of all, it's, it's nice to see that somebody recognizes, recognizes that almost all people are bisexual by nature as the uh, site uh, starts out. It's also very important to differentiate yet again between same-sex sex or, or between uh, different kinds of same-sex sex, to differentiate between uh, the more effeminate kinds of same-sex sex and the rest of humanity, apparently, who is bisexual by nature. And we're going to go into that differentiation in another video in a follow-up to this. I uh, just wanted to give a short review. A third reason is also that you can prove the bisexuality of most men by looking at eunuchs or gay men or whatever else, because in the ancient world, these eunuchs had sex with other men, generally with masculine men. So whereas Guerrero tries to prove the bisexuality of most men by looking at masculine on masculine relationships, another way of looking at bisexuality of most men, uh, and thereby looking at and thereby disproving the inanity of sexual orientation as a whole. Uh, or at least the specifics uh, of our system now, is to look at the bisexuality by the way of masculine-feminine relationships. Okay. So you could look at masculine men having sex with uh, more feminine men in a kind of heteronormative manner. And, and a lot of the people explain this in a way as, oh, well, this is just situational homosexuality. It's just, it's just heterosexual mimicry because... Uh, if you have a masculine man and a feminine man, that's kind of like a heterosexual relationship. The only problem is the very category, the very framework of heterosexual, homosexual, uh, only refers to people's genitalia. So you can't cheat and say, well, we're just going to round up a heteronormative, heterosexual-like relationship into heterosexuality. Because if you're going to change the definition of heterosexuality to mean active person, uh, or a top, or the more masculine person in a relationship, you also have to change the definition of homosexuality, which renders the whole system meaningless. And then we just go back to the ancient uh, categorization based on gender or based on sexual position, which is fine by me, but it's, it's, it's extremely disingenuous to try to rescue heterosexuality by saying, well, this, this instant of men having sex with other men, well, this is just like heterosexuality. No, 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 that's nonsense. So anyways, uh, in the next video on, on reviewing this, or, or 
Well, in the next video, I'm going to try to tie back um, the differentiation between gays, uh, between gays and greros, or gays and masculine men, and different kinds of same-sex relationships uh, as it relates to chapter 10 and the conflation that I talked about in chapter 10. Now, in terms of the, um, in terms of what I just said, that bisexuality can be proven uh, male to female, and the responses to that, situational homosexuality, or though it's heteronormative, I also talk about that in chapter 7 and chapter 13. Uh, and again, all of these references will be linked in the thread, so if you want to click through and, and dig a little deeper into it, feel free to do that. Thank you very much.